Russia is facing a demographics crisis. You see, every 25 to 27 years, a significantly lower number of people in Russia enter adulthood, the time when they would normally be starting families and raising children, than there could and should be. In the long term, this may threaten the stability of Russian society and, consequently, Russia's security. Hold up. I've been doing this for far too long, and I can already see where the comments are going. I am just reading off all of the Western talking points, right? Part of some information plot coming out of the CIA. Or maybe I'm just a crazy academic on another one of his tangents. Mm, nope. Those were direct quotes from Vladimir Putin on August 29th, 2018, taken straight from the Kremlin's website. The speech occurred in the shadow of protests that had erupted across Russia over the prior two months, and shortly after Russia concluded hosting the World Cup. The passages are part of a larger marathon that consisted of half an hour of policy proposals regarding one of the central problems that Russia faced at the time, and something that we will often be referring back to later today. Indeed, demographics have been part of an open discussion within the Kremlin as far back as recent memory goes, a problem without an obvious solution, a dilemma with only bad options. And with the invasion of Ukraine now being measured in years, it has only gotten worse, especially with no end in sight to either of the related crises. The implications here are serious. We know it has already caused instability within the Kremlin. Some think it caused the invasion of Ukraine. Two international criminal court arrest warrants subsequently trace back to it, and certainly the consequences of the war are going to place greater demographic burdens on whoever resides in the Kremlin for decades to come. Buckle up, and I hope you like population pyramids and some very old photos with critical consequences for today. If you do, then in this video, we are going to examine the two sources of the demographics drama, World War II and the fall of the Soviet Union. And then we will switch to the problems that the demographics drop-off has caused. Government finance problems and the 2018 pension protests. The preventive war incentive it created with Ukraine. And the long-term domestic issues that will arise however the war may end. And the risk of dark days ahead. But first, today's story is one that goes back generations. So it is fitting that the sponsor of this video is MyHeritage. MyHeritage is a website that allows you to quickly and easily build your family tree using a massive library of records and databases. Personally, I'm embarrassed to say that I knew very little about my own family tree past my grandparents. But even with just the basic names to go from, I easily grew out my tree to many of my great-great-grandparents, and even some great-great-great-grandparents in just a couple of evenings. In the process, I learned a bunch of things about them, from their origins in Germany and France, to more quirky factoids like how my great-great-grandfather was a saloon keeper, and his 16-year-old son was, oh goodness, a bartender. I guess it was a different era. Anyway, one of the most impressive features of my heritage is a catalog of yearbooks that dates back to the 90s, and by that I mean the 1890s. So not only was I able to identify basic information about my long-lost ancestors, I could get a feel for what their lives were way back when. Given the demographics of this channel, I can only imagine how cool it would be if I were part of the older cohort and found myself in a yearbook that I had long since forgotten about or misplaced. Moreover, with a single click, a companion feature called My Heritage in Color will instantly modernize the photos you find. And actually, you already saw this in action. That's how we went from Tsar Nicholas II to Tsar Nicholas II. So get researching today! Click the link in the description, or scan the QR code on the screen right now to start your 14-day free trial. Problems with the future begin with problems in the past, though. So we will begin with the genesis of the demographics crisis. World War II, or the Great Patriotic War, as it is called in Russia. It remains, and hopefully will forever stay, mankind's darkest period. Allied victory in the conflict came at a high cost for the entire coalition but no country bore the burden to the extent that the Soviet Union did. In total, about 27 million Soviets perished in the war, which represented about 8.6% of the pre-war population. The result was this ugly-looking population pyramid 
using that word loosely because you really have to squint to get a triangle here. Regardless, from the top to the bottom, the whole thing is a mess. There are tons of excess females from all of the male combat fatalities. There is a lingering indentation from World War I and the Russian Revolution casualties, and a corresponding echo from it at younger ages. Then you have no one being born during the war. But the long-term problem is that these excess women had no one to reproduce with. And that slight complication would come to haunt Stalin and every Moscow chief after him. Fast forward to the beginning of the broader Russia-Ukraine conflict, and the pyramid had morphed to this. What was left of the World War II veterans is up here, complete with the surplus of females on the other side. The bulge is from those who were children during the war, and you still have a large surplus of females on the other side, because the life expectancy gap in Russia is 10.6 years greater for women. By comparison, in the United States, it is 5.8 years. Back to the pyramid. You also have the lack of children born during the war, and then followed by a baby boom. But the major population problem are these two ripples. Echoes of the World War II fallen, being unable to produce the next generation of Russians. Every 20 to 25 years, you get the next generation that traces back to the missing cohort, with the wartime casualties from long ago still causing fewer people to be born in the contemporaneous moment. The way it manifests itself changes over time, both because of variance in age and when a member of a cohort reproduces. But it will be more than a century before everything levels off. The other half of Russia's demographics problem comes from low fertility rates. Going back to the population pyramid, Low fertility rates are hard to see because the ripple effects mask what is going on. But the key to remember is that people, last I checked anyway, die over time. So when you see the number of people in the 60 to 70 range, roughly similar to the cohort around 10 to 20, that is a really bad sign. On the surface, the cause appears to be the same story that basically all developed economies are encountering. Modern technology allows a country to accumulate a ton of wealth, would-be parents internalize the higher opportunity cost of having children, and birth rates decline. You can find the pattern worldwide. It is there in the United Kingdom at 1.6 births per woman. You get concerned looking at Japan. You get downright terrified looking at South Korea. And you see a bit of it in the United States, too. Russia's rate is 1.4. The thing is, though, that Russia is not a developed economy, and so the problem here is not a matter of opportunity cost. Instead, the root cause is economic collapse. Flashback to 1991. The fall of the Soviet Union brought upon an upheaval that left Russians financially questioning whether they could afford to have children. It turns out that the old Soviet system was unsustainable, but transitioning away from it to something that at least briefly resembled a free market economy, was temporarily worse. The effects were devastating. Russia's fertility rate dropped from a sustainable 2.22 in 1987 to just 1.16 in 1999. It peaked back again at 1.78 in 2015, but never returned to replacement level. The result is a hollowing out of the younger half of the millennial age group, much to the consternation of avocado toast craftsmen in Moscow. Now, I think those chefs will manage, so instead let's focus on the real problems. For the sake of a healthy economy, collapsing demographics is bad. But Russia's pension plan causes it to be a more concerning political issue. The Russian pension system is functionally similar to other pension systems worldwide. At its core, Russia takes advantage of the fact that getting old is hazardous to one's health. Consequently, you can have many more young workers paying into the system than you have retirees withdrawing from it. That allows the system to keep on humming. That is also why detractors of socialized systems like to compare them to pyramid schemes, though another way to think about them is as insurance programs that pay out in the unfortunate situation where you safely live into old age. 
The problem with the pyramid scheme, though, is that this is not Russia's population pyramid. It is 1910 Germany. This was Russia's population pyramid as the pension crisis set in. Both of Russia's demographic quirks cause massive headaches here. You are likely familiar with the issue with declining birth rates, because it is the same one that the West has been wrestling with, especially if you are South Korea. Take a healthy population pyramid, and invert it, and now you have too few people paying for way too many retirees. You simply cannot stretch a ruble that far. For those of you stateside, it is like the problems with Social Security, but turned up to 11, to the point where it becomes the only thing in Washington that anyone wants to talk about. Meanwhile, Russia's problem with World War II ripples is more subtle. Even if the population were pyramidic, pyramidical, pyramidy, pyramid-like, whatever the adjective is, a pyramid with ripples is still not good for the ratio. Indeed, every couple of decades, the pension scheme takes a punch to the gut, with a small cohort entering the workforce and needing to prop up disproportionately many retirees. The most recent iteration of this began to take hold in 2018, while the rest of the world was watching a summit between Korean leaders and Donald Trump was withdrawing from the Iran deal. Russia was feeling the pinch. I mentioned at the beginning of today that Russia's demographics problem was an open topic of conversation in the country. Well, that year, it was the single biggest legislative question as well. Recognizing that the system was at risk of becoming insolvent, Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev's cabinet proposed the type of reforms that you might imagine, given the circumstances. Namely, to raise retirement ages from 60 to 65 for men, and from 55 to 63 for women. These changes were unpopular to say the least, and led Putin, who apparently was hiding in the background the entire time, to go on a persuasion campaign to convince Russians that reforms this big were necessary. That did not work. Protests erupted on the streets, led by a broad coalition of anti-Putin figures, including someone named Alexei Navalny. It is tempting to say that this was the biggest threat to Putin's tenure since he came into office. However, as mentioned at the top, the affair ran concurrently with Russia hosting the 2018 World Cup. Football was about to become a political issue, and not in a fun, silly way. Roy Kent can be here, there, and everywhere, but those protesters were not afforded the same luxury. Part of Russia's hosting duties meant that cities with World Cup venues needed to maintain law and order, which in turn meant no protests. This was largely followed. So you had protests, but orderly protests. They were still a concern for Putin, especially with his polling numbers sliding from 82% in April to 67% in July, but they did not exactly spell imminent danger. Ultimately, the Kremlin made some minor adjustments to the proposal. The men's retirement age kept the full reform, but the target for women's retirement dropped from 63 down to 60, and the policy provided some exceptions for women with more than two children. Not exactly the worst idea if you want to incentivize a higher fertility rate. The compromise worked, mostly. The decline in popularity contributed to Medvedev's cabinet resigning in 2020, but otherwise left Putin unscathed, with an important warning that there were limits to the policies that Putin could implement. Things held relatively steady until 2022 and the invasion of Ukraine. One theory behind the conflict points back to the demographics. Quick review of preventive war theory. Suppose that this is the expected outcome of war if fought under the current military situation. War destroys things, though, and so Russia's net payoff from fighting recedes back to here, with the space between the white and the red lines representing how much Russia internalizes those costs in terms of square kilometers of territory. Same thing on Ukraine's side with this yellow line. If these were the only concerns, we would expect the parties to reach a settlement. That is because any division between the yellow and red lines mimics what a war would produce, but both sides would save on the costs of conflict. 
Imagine, though, that the expected outcome of war was changing over time, perhaps over to here. Something interesting happens when this shift is substantial. In the future, the best Russia can hope for in negotiations is to obtain out to here. But by fighting today, Russia can secure out to here. Consequently, Russia has an incentive to go to war now to prevent the disadvantageous effects of the power shift from occurring. Demographics often provide a narrative for this sort of war mechanism. To reverse the current situation, during the lead-up to World War I, Germany grew concerned of Russia's growing population and the investment that St. Petersburg was making in its military. Today's version is more nuanced. According to the argument, the Kremlin was looking at its population pyramid, observing that the last large glut of fighting-aged males was about to be not-so-fighting-aged, and realized that waiting a little bit longer was a ticket to disaster. Thus, if the Kremlin wanted to intervene in Ukrainian politics the hard way, this was the final feasible opportunity to do so. Now for the nuance. It is worth noting that Ukrainians are also experiencing the same sort of demographic decline. After all, Ukrainians were a part of the Soviet World War II casualties, and they too endured the economic calamity of the fall of the Soviet Union. Actually, after 2014, Ukraine's birth rate began dropping lower than Russia's. It is hard to understate how big of an issue this is for Ukraine. For example, the dimple here is a major reason why Ukraine has not yet mobilized its younger cohort. And at some point, we will have to do a dedicated video on the topic. Regardless, the question of whose demographics look worse may not matter for the preventive war theory. Taking and controlling territory requires a great deal of manpower, so the relative force ratio may matter less than the raw Russian numbers. If this is what is driving the war, then it is really, really bad news for an early end to the conflict. Wars start when bargaining frictions like shifting power outweigh the cost disincentives. They therefore end when the fighting resolves the bargaining friction. When the friction is something like disagreement over the expected outcome, a topic that we recently covered in depth, then the act of fighting reveals who is right and who is wrong, and then the war will magically dry up. But when the friction is a demographics problem, no simple amount of conflict is going to fix the issue. Instead, this naturally lends itself to a situation where either 1. Russia conquers and secures the amount of territory that it wishes to, or 2. Ukraine fights long enough, and incurs plenty of casualties by doing so, to destroy enough of the Russian military that the former option is no longer physically or politically possible. Neither of those possibilities is particularly pleasant to think about. The final point of demographic concern is what the war is going to cause in the near future. We can divide these concerns into two buckets, casualties and immigration. Starting with the first, trying to get a good casualty figure is next to impossible. That is because the true number is politicized. Russia wants to keep it low to maintain a narrative of success, while Ukraine's incentives are flipped. Let's suppose that it is 100,000 Russians dead, which is close to what a leaked U.S. estimate claims, and you will be absolutely shocked to learn is above Russia's count, but below Ukraine's. As the tone of my voice perhaps indicated, I am not even trying to suggest that this is an accurate number, because I have no idea. I am still not an intelligence organization. Rather, the point here is to get a feel for the consequences. Taking a look at Russia's 2023 population pyramid, you would barely notice anything. This line is for 1 million people. So even if you were to somehow limit all of the casualties to 47-year-old men, you would still be reducing that single bucket by less than 10%. Obviously, 100,000 fewer people contributing to pensions is not helpful. But it is not singularly backbreaking either. Of course, some portion of the war wounded will be unable to work again, and thus will not be contributing to the fund as well. And from a financial perspective, 
They are worse because they will be drawing from state money for the rest of their lives. But even then, stretching out the damage to an extreme half million is hardly game ending. That is just how it works when you have a total population of 147 million. Thus, at least in the short run, Russia has no economic need to leave Ukraine. As such, if Russia were to up and leave, it would instead have to be due to political pressure, which can happen as a result of that many dead. Still, there are a few deeper concerns. First, if the war continues for long enough, and Russia keeps trying high-casualty battle strategies, then eventually there will be problems. Second, Perhaps the more pressing concern is people leaving Russia. Again, this is a political issue, so reliable numbers are hard to come by. Some estimates indicate that there may be in the high six figures, or even past a million, which is now starting to sound like a demographic problem. Worse, poor people cannot simply get on a plane and leave. It is the more affluent people who can. And if they are not contributing to the economy, well, that is going to start putting a lot more pressure on the top-heavy pyramid. Now, some of these departures came from the top, people who have already made their wealth. But a substantial portion came from the high-skilled workers in this younger cohort, which is already precariously small. Actually, that is one of the hypotheses regarding why Russia invaded in the first place, as a way to move children from the newfound war zone and into central Russia. This is the origin of the arrest warrants mentioned at the top. But it is not going to be possible to do that at a scale that would solve a problem as big as this one is. Finally, the more subtle issue is with immigration. Part of why the pension problem was not a complete disaster is that Russia was an attractive place to immigrate to, and not just for US-based actors. This is a legacy of the Soviet era, where Moscow, St. Petersburg, and elsewhere were THE places to be within the Eastern Bloc. In 2021 alone, net migration added 430,000 people to Russia's population, which, for perspective, dwarfs that earlier hypothetical casualty figure. However, the future of that immigration is in question. The Kremlin has been doing everything that it can to keep soldiers on the front lines, while minimizing political risks. That is why the mobilizations disproportionately hit what you might think of as the far-flung regions of the country. It is also why Russia has been hitting the prison recruitment hard. And now there are allegations that Russia is impressing immigrants into the army, under the threat of deporting their families and under the promise of citizenship in return for compliance. More recently, a scandal surfaced where Indian immigrants were recruited for support roles, but instead found themselves pushed into combat. Like many of Russia's other strategies during the war, this is fixing a problem for today, at the risk of creating a much greater problem tomorrow. Here, that new problem is deterring would-be immigrants from entering the country out of fear of impressment. So far, though, the Kremlin has done well finding the right string of band-aids to keep everything going. However, a decline in immigration will pack a big punch, even if it will take a long time for it to come to the forefront. But what won't take a long time is for you to build your family tree if you sign up at MyHeritage. Thanks again to the folks over there for sponsoring today's video. And if you enjoyed the video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care.